Hey, y'all, what's happening? Thank you so much for coming back. This is Storytime with Julian. I am the Julian in question. And the story tonight is coming from this wonderful book, Crick Crack by Edwidge Danticat. Um, we have read from this book before. Some of you may remember um, Ms. Danticat's stories have uh, wonderful flights of fancy sometimes. They can trade in uh, a little bit of darkness sometimes, sometimes there's sorrow. Um, but overall, a lovely, very uh, lyrical writer. We've enjoyed her works before. There is, of course, um, West Indian and Caribbean heritage woven throughout. That means at times I might stumble across an accent that I was ill prepared for. I'm going to do the best I can. I'm going to let y'all know that I am, uh, <laughs> I'm getting some tutoring. I've got, uh, I've got some folks that's going to try and, uh, and help me get it, get it right and tight for some of my, uh, sight words for that. And we just want to take our time and enjoy this. We're just doing this one piece tonight. So we'll have a little bit of time for discussion. This is, as always, a cold read, so I know you've seen the disclaimer, but as always, please make sure to protect yourself. If the story begins to tread on some territory that is difficult for you, um, that is possibly offensive for you, then by all means, self-care comes first. Remove yourself from the situation, check in, maybe you've got a friend who's watching, find out if it gets better later, but always um, make sure that you take care of yourself. We're gonna present the art as it is written, and with that, let's begin. The Missing Piece. We were playing with leaves shaped like butterflies. Raymond limped from the ashes of the old schoolhouse and threw himself on top of a high pile of dirt. The dust rose in clouds around him, clinging to the lapels of his khaki uniform. You should see the sunset from here. He grabbed my legs and pulled me down on top of him. The rusty grass brushed against my chin as I slipped out of his grasp. I got up and tried to run to the other side of the field, but he caught both my legs and yanked me down again. Don't you feel like a woman when you are with me? He tickled my neck. Don't you feel beautiful? He let go of my waist and I turned over and laid flat on my back. The sun was sliding behind the hills, and the glare made the rock shimmer like chunks of gold. I know I can make you feel like a woman, he said. So why don't you let me? There we go. I know I can make you feel like a woman, he said. So why don't you let me? My grandmother says I can't have babies. Forget your grandmother. Would you tell me again how you got your limp? I asked to distract him. It was a question he liked to answer, a chance for him to show his bravery. If I tell you, will you let me touch your breasts? It is an insult that you are even asking. Will you let me do it? You will never know unless you tell me the story. He closed his eyes as though the details were never any further than the stage behind his eyelids. I already knew the story very well. I was on guard one night, he said, taking a deep theatrical breath. No one told me that there had been a coup in Port-au-Prince. I was still wearing my old regime uniform. My friend Toto from the Youth Corps says he didn't know if I was old regime or new regime. So he shot a warning shot at the uniform, not at me, but at the uniform. The shots were coming fast. I was afraid. I forgot the password. Then one of Toto's bullets hit me on my leg and I remembered. I yelled out the password and he stopped shooting. Why didn't you take off your uniform? I asked, laughing. He ignored the question, letting his hand wander between the buttons of my blouse. Do you remember the password? He asked. Yes. I don't tell it to just anyone. Lean closer and whisper it in my ear. I leaned real close and whispered the word in his ear. Don't ever forget, if you are in trouble, it could save your life, he said. I will remember. 
Tell me again what it is. I swallowed a gulp of dusty air and said, Peace. A round of gunshots rang through the air, signaling that curfew was about to begin. I should go back now, I said. He made no effort to get up, but raised his hand to his lips and blew me a kiss. Look out for yourself tonight, I said. Peace. On the way home, I cut through a line of skeletal houses that had been torched the night of the coup. A lot of the old regime followers died that night. Others fled to the hills or took boats to Miami. I rushed past a churchyard where the security officers sometimes buried the bodies of old regime people. The yard was bordered with chain link fence, but every once in a while, if you looked very closely, you could see a bushy head of hair poking through the ground. There was a bed of red hibiscus in the footpath behind the yard. Covering my nose, I pulled up a few stems and ran all the way home with them. My grandmother was sitting in the rocking chair in front of our house, making knots in the sisal rope around her waist. She grabbed the hibiscus from my hand and threw them on the floor. How many times must I tell you, she said, those things grow with blood on them. Pulling a, pulling a leaf from my hair, she slapped me on the shoulder and shoved me inside the house. Somebody rented the two rooms in the yellow house, she said, saliva flying from between her front teeth. I want you to go bring the lady some needles and thread. My grandmother had fixed up the yellow house very nicely so that many visitors who passed through the Ville Rose came to stay in it. Sometimes our boarders were French and American journalists who wanted to take pictures of the churchyard where you could see the bodies. I rushed out to my grandmother's garden, hoping to catch a glimpse of our new guest. Then I went over to the basin of rainwater in the yard and took off my clothes. My grandmother scrubbed a handful of mint leaves up and down my back as she ran a comb through my hair. It's a lady, said my grandmother. Don't give her a head full of things to worry about. Things you say, thoughts you have, will decide how people treat you. Is the lady alone? She's like all those foreign women. She feels she can be alone. And she smokes, too. My grandmother giggled. She smokes just like an old woman when life gets hard. She smokes a pipe? Ladies her age don't smoke pipes. Cigarettes, then. I don't want you to ask her to let you smoke any. Is she a journalist? I asked. That is no concern of mine, my grandmother said. Is she intelligent? Intelligence is not only in reading and writing. Is she old regime or new regime? She is like us. The only regime she believe in is God's regime. She says she wants to write things down for posterity. What did you tell her when she said that? That I already have posterity. I was once a baby and now I'm an old woman. That is posterity. If she asks me questions, I am going to answer them, I said. One day you will stick your hand in a stew that will burn your fingers. I told her to watch I told her to watch her mouth as how she talks to people. I told her to watch out for vagabonds like Toto and Raymond. Never look them in the eye. I told her that too, my grandmother said as she discarded the mint leaves. My whole body felt taut and taint-free. My grandmother's face softened as she noticed the sheen of cleanliness. See, you can be a pretty girl, she said, handing me her precious pouch of needles, thimbles, and thread. You can be a very pretty girl, just like your mother used to be. A burst of evening air chilled my face as I walked across to the yellow house. I was wearing my only Sunday outfit, a white lace dress that I had worn to my confirmation two years before. The lady poked her head through the door after my first knock. Mademoiselle Gallant, how do you know my name? My grandmother sent me. She was wearing a pair of abacos, American blue jeans. It looks as though your grandmother has put you to some inconvenience, she said. Then she led me to the front room with its oversized mahogany chairs and a desk that my grandmother had bought especially for the journalists to use when they were working there. My name is really Emile, 
she said in Creole with a very heavy American accent. What do people call you? L'amour. How did you come to be named? How did your name come to be death? My mother died while I was being born, I explained. My grandmother was really mad at me for that. They should have given you your mother's name, she said, taking the pouch of needles, threads, and thimbles from me. That is the way it should have been done. She walked over to the table in the corner and picked up a pitcher of lemonade that my grandmother had made for her, for all her guests when they first arrived. Would you like some? She said, already pouring the lemonade. Oui, madame, please. She held a small carton box of butter cookies in front of me. I took one, only one, just as my grandmother would have done. Are you a journalist? I asked her. Why do you ask that? The people who stay in this house usually are journalists. She lit a cigarette. The smoke breathed in and out of her mouth, just like her own breath. <sighs> I'm not a journalist, she said. I've come here to pay a little visit. Who are you visiting? Just people. Why don't you stay with the people you're visiting? I don't want to bother them. Are they old regime or new regime? Who? Your people. Why do you ask? Because things you say, thoughts you have, will decide how people treat you. It seems to me you are the journalist, she said. What do you believe in, old regime or new regime? Your grandmother told me to say to anyone who was interested, the only regime I believe in is God's regime. I would wager that you are a very good source for the journalist. Do you have any schooling? A little. Once again, she held the box of cookies in front of me. I took another cookie, but she kept the box there in the same place. I took yet another cookie and another until the whole box was empty. Can you read what it says there? She asked, pointing at a line of red letters. I cannot read American, I said. Though many of the journalists who came to stay at the Yellow House had tried to teach me, I had not learned. It is not American, she said. They are French cookies. That says Le Petit Ecolier. I stuffed my mouth in shame. Intelligence is not only in reading and writing, I said. I did not mean to make you feel ashamed, she said, dropping her cigarette into the half glass of lemonade in her hand. I want to ask you a question. I will answer if I can. My mother was old regime, she said. She was a journalist for a newspaper called Libet in Port-au-Prince. She came to Ville Rose, maybe, or some other town. I don't know. The people who worked with her in Port-au-Prince said that she might be in this region. Do you remember any shootings the night of the coup? There were many shootings, I said. Did you see any of the bodies? My grandmother and me, we stayed inside. Did a woman come to your door? Did anyone ever say that a woman in a purple dress came to their door? No. I hear there's a mass burial site, she said. Do you know it? Yes. I've taken journalists there. I would like to go there. Can you take me? Now? Yes. She pulled some coins from her purse and placed them on the table. I have more, she said. From the back pocket of her jeans, she took out an envelope full of pictures. I ran my fingers over the glossy paper that froze her mother into all kinds of smiling poses. A skinny brown woman with shiny black hair and short spiral curls. I have never seen her, I admitted. It is possible that she arrived in the evening and then the coup take place in the and the coup took place in the middle of the night. Do you know if they found any dead women the day after the coup? There were no bodies, I said. That is to say, no funerals. I heard my grandmother's footsteps even before she reached the door to the yellow house. If you tell her that I'm here, I can't go with you. I said, 
Go into the next room and stay there until I come for you. My grandmother knocked once, and then a second time. I rushed to the next room and crouched in a corner. The plain white sheets that we usually covered the bed with had been replaced by a large piece of purple cloth. On the cement floor, there were many pieces of cloth lined up in squares, one next to the other. Thank you for sending me the needles, I heard Emily say to my grandmother. I thought I had packed some in my suitcase, but I must have forgotten them. My old eyes are not what they used to be, my grandmother said in the shy, humble voice she reserved for prayers and total strangers. But if you need some mending, I can do it for you. Thank you, said Emily. But I can do the mending myself. Very well, then. Is my granddaughter here? She had to run off, Emily said. Do you know where she went? I don't know. She was dressed for a very fancy affair. My grandmother was silent for a minute as her knuckles tapped the wood on the front door. I will let you rest now, said my grandmother. Thank you for the needles, said Emily. Emily bolted the door after my grandmother had left. Is there a way we can leave without her seeing you? She came into the room with a flashlight and her American passport. You might get a little beating when you go home. What are those small pieces of cloth for? I asked. I'm going to sew them onto that purple blanket, she said. All her life, my mother wanted to sew old things together onto that piece of purple cloth. She raised a piece of white lace above her head. That's from my grandmother's wedding. That's from my mother's wedding dress. Grabbing a piece of pink terry cloth, she said, That's an old baby bib. Tears were beginning to cloud her eyes. She fought them away fast by pushing her head back. Purple, she said, was Mama's favorite color. I can ask my grandmother if she saw your mother, I said. When I first came this afternoon, I showed her the pictures and like you, she said no. We would tell you if we had seen her. I want to go to the churchyard, she said. You say you've already taken other people there. I walk by it every day. Let's go then. Sometimes the yard's guarded at night, I warned her. I have an American passport. Maybe that will help. The soldiers don't know the difference. Most of them are like me. They would not be able to identify your cookies either. How old are you? She asked. Fourteen. At your age, you already have a wide reputation. I have a journalist friend who has stayed in this house. He told me you are the only person who would take me to the yard. I could not think which particular journalist would have given me such a high recommendation. There had been so many. Better to be known for good than bad, I said to her. I'm ready to go, she announced. If she is there, will you take her away? Who? Your mother. I have not thought that far. And if you see them carrying her, what will you do? She will belong to them and not you. They say a girl becomes a woman when she loses her mother, she said. You, child, were born a woman. We walked through the footpath in my grandmother's garden toward the main road. I've been having these awful dreams, Emily whispered, and she plucked some leaves off my grandmother's pumpkin vines. I see my mother sinking into a river, and she keeps calling my name. A round of gunshots echoed in the distance, signals from the night guards who had no other ways of speaking to one another. We stopped on the side of the road and waited for a while, and then continued on our way. The night air blew the smell of rotting flesh to my nose. We circled the churchyard carefully before finding an entrance route. There was a rustle in the yard, like pieces of tin scraping the moist dirt. Who is there? I thought she stopped breathing when the voice echoed in the night air. I'm an American journalist, Emily said in breathless Creole. She pulled out her passport and raised it toward a blinding flashlight beam. The guard moved the light away from our faces. 
It was Raymond's friend, Toto, the one who had taken a shot at him. He was tall and skinny and looked barely 16. He was staring at me as though he was possessed by a spirit. In the night, he did not know me. He took Emily's passport and flipped through it quickly. What are you doing here? He asked, handing the passport back to her. It is after curfew. The lady was not feeling well, I said, so she asked me to take her for a walk. Didn't you hear the signals? Asked Toto. The curfew has already started. You would not want to have blood on your nice communion dress. Two other soldiers passed us on their way to the field. They were dragging the blood-soaked body of a bearded man with an old election slogan written on a t-shirt across his chest. Alone we are weak, together we are a flood. The guards were carrying him feet first, like a breech berth. Emily moved forward toward the body as though she wanted to see it better. You see nothing, Toto said, reaching up to turn Emily's face. Her eyes twitched from Toto's touch on her cheek. Under God's sky, you do this to people, she hollered in a brazen creole. Toto laughed loudly. We're doing that poor indig indig mm -mm. We're doing that poor indigent a favor burying him, he said. Emily moved forward, trying to follow the guards, taking the body into the yard. You see nothing, Toto said again, grabbing her face. She raised her arm as if to strike him. He seized her wrist in midair and whisked her hand behind her back. You see nothing, he said, his voice hissing between his teeth. Repeat after me. You see nothing. I see nothing, I said in her place. The lady does not understand. I see you, she said in Creole. How can that be nothing? Peace. Let her go, I said. You are a coward, she told him. He lowered his head so he was staring directly into her eyes. He twisted her arm like a wet rag. Peace, have mercy on her, I said. Let her ask for herself, he said. She stamped her feet on his boots. He let go of her hand and tapped his rifle on her shoulder. Emily looked up at him, angry and stunned. He moved back, aiming his rifle at her head, squinting as though he was going to shoot. Peace! I hollered. My eyes fell on Raymond's as he walked out of the field. I mouthed the word, pleading for help. Peace, 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 peace. They'll go, Raymond said to Toto. Then go! Toto shouted, let me watch you go. Let's go, I said to Emily. My grandmother will be mad at me if I get killed. Raymond walked behind us as we went back to the road. The password has changed, he said. Stop saying peace. By the time I turned around to look at his face, he was already gone. Emily and I said nothing to each other on the way back. The sound of bullets continued to ring through the night. You never looked them in the eye, I told her when we got to the yellow house doorstep. Is that how you do it? I helped her up the steps and into the house. I'm going to sew these old pieces of cloth on my mother's blanket tonight, she said. She took a needle from my grandmother's bundle and began sewing. Her fingers moved quickly as she stitched the pieces together. I should go, I said, eyeing the money still on the table. Please, stay. I will pay you more if you stay with me until the morning. My grandmother will worry. What was your mother's name? She asked. Marie Magdalene, I said. They should have given you that name instead of what you got. Was your mother pretty? I don't know. She never took portraits like the one you have of yours. Did you know those men who were in the yard tonight? Yes. I didn't fight them because I didn't want to make trouble for you later, she said. We should write down their names. For posterity. We already had posterity, I said. 
when we were babies and we grew old. You're still young, she said. You're not old. My grandmother is old for me. If she is old for you, then doesn't it matter if you get old? You can't say that. You can't just say what she wants for you to say. I didn't get in a fight with them because I did not want them to hurt you, she said. I will stay with you, I said, because I know you're afraid. I curled my body on the floor next to her and went to sleep. She had the patches sewn together on the purple blanket when I woke up that morning. On the floor, scattered around her, were the pictures of her mother. I became a woman last night, she said. I lost my mother and all my other dreams. Her voice was weighed down with pain and fatigue. She picked up the coins from the table, added a dollar from her purse, and pressed the money into my palm. Will you whisper their names in my ear? She asked. I will write them down. There is Toto, I said. He is the one that hit you. And the one who followed us? That is Raymond, who loves leaves shaped like butterflies. She jotted their names on the back of one of her mother's pictures and gave it to me. My mother's name was Isabel, she said. Keep this for posterity. Outside, the morning sun was coming out to meet the day. Emily sat on the porch and watched me go to my grandmother's house. Loosely sewn, the pieces on the purple blanket around her shoulders were coming apart. My grandmother was sitting in front of the house waiting for me. She did not move when she saw me, nor did she make a sound. Today, I want you to call me by another name, I said. Haughty girls don't get far, she said, rising from the chair. I want you to call me by her name, I said. She looked pained as she watched me moving closer to her. Marie Magdalene? Yes, Marie Magdalene. I want you to call me Marie Magdalene. I like the sound of that. And thus endeth the story. Thank you so much for sticking with me as we read through The Missing Piece by Edwidge Dandicat from her book, Crick Crack. Oh, that was a beautiful story. I told you she wrote poetically. Um, the stories in Crick Crack don't always, um, they don't always come to the kind of satisfying conclusions with the kind of narrative arcs that we often look for. They are often moments. And I love, I love in this story that it was the, the, the story itself felt like a snapshot. It felt like a photograph and the role of photographs in this story um, really just, I don't know, it, it was so soft and, and truly beautiful. Um, let's take a look at the time. We are super early, y'all. It's only 1030. And I had only planned to read this one story, but that does give us some time for discussion. And for those of you all who are willing to sit with, that gives us some time to do a simple story. I don't have my simple book with me here, though, so I'm going to have to... Let me see where where's simple at. Where simple get to? <laughs> um, but let's go ahead and uh, and go through some of the comments. All right, let me see what we got. Let me see what we got. All right. Well, somebody here in the building speaks a little French. Dans mon esprit, tu es mon ami. Uh, in my spirit, you are my friend. Is that right? Did I get that right? Something like that. Oh, thank you so much. Erica Goodman is watching on 
Facebook and had a had a YouTube going. Appreciate it. We appreciate the views. Sonequa says that darkness gets crucially and critically real. Her sharpness is incomparable. Um, this story is a is a really it is, it's a fascinating and beautiful um insight into grief and the sort of juxtaposition or the the placement of these two characters in each other's lives both of whom are grieving their mother um but at different stages one seems to just walk around in that grief her name lamore who that's that was heavy um but she she is you know by dint of her name i wouldn't say by virtue but by dint of her name she is walking grief um and then and then we meet uh emily who is looking for confirmation um and i think you know we can sense from the beginning of the story that she comes into it with a sense that her mother is gone but looking for that that final note. April said that uh, Raymond is on some F boy stuff. Um, yeah, he's he, mercifully, he is at that age where it's some, it's boyhood F boy stuff. Hopefully, he will be shown how to grow out of it, though, as a child soldier, I'm disinclined to think that's likely. There's a question here from Angela. Me, who was in the uniform? Uh, Raymond was in uniform, but he was in the wrong uniform for the current regime. And so he was um, he was in some danger. Um, no comment. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Sonequa says, the history is exactly what I think about reading Edwidge, especially after experiencing this book. The backdrop she writes from Clutch My Heart. Yeah, I think it's, it's absolutely spectacular the, um, the ways that she can draw, draw history and culture and still paint these beautiful um, individual portraits, these, these portraits of, of these people within these really dramatic, uh, context that line you child were born a woman that was one of those lines and also this one preserved the voice that she reserved for prayer and total strangers um, to my Christian heart that was like ooh, what does it mean to use the same voice that you use with God with total strangers is that elevating total strangers or is that lowering God to, or is it, is it suggesting a distance in that relationship with God? I don't know. That kind of hit me. That kind of hit me. Terry says that she loved the story. I'm guessing that love how the title played into the conflict. Yeah. Um, a missing piece and how it, toward the end of the story, not only is she informed that peace is no longer the password, but she's not given the new one. And that was that was that final kiss off. Um, <laughs> Sneak would say, "Grandma ain't nothing to play with." That is true. Judy Lee asks, "Was uh, was this set in Jamaica?" No, this was set in Haiti. Um, all of these are set in Haiti, um, I believe. Amanda asks, "Are the pieces of fabric not sturdy because peace is so fragile?" I hadn't considered that, but that is a beautiful consideration. It's altogether possible. Um, I think that, you know, with the the main fabric being the purple of her mother's, but these additional pieces never quite getting added. Um, it it feels to me like this is this is going to be forever undone. That this is something that she's doing symbolically but um, that it didn't, it wasn't ever really going to be, um, ever going to be finished. That's, that's how, how it occurred for me. Um, Terry says, one of the saddest things for me is that the quilting 
was not sturdy. Further testimonial that she'll be. Yeah. I, what you said. <laughs> um, Erica says, my favorite line was definitely intelligence isn't just in reading or writing. OK, that was heavy. That was heavy. I love that one, too. Listen, y'all, um, we've got a little bit of time yet. If y'all are down, I could go pull the simple book and we could read a couple of simple stories. Is that something y'all are up for? Um, let me know with your comments. And uh, if so, we'll go ahead and do that. Um, you know, I'm always good for a simple story. I think it, especially when we have something that's a little bit more somber like this, but you know, this is, this is y'all show too. So you tell me what y'all want. The... 17, 16 of you that remain. And that's all right. Because like I said, numbers do lie sometimes. Y'all let me know what y'all are feeling. I see Terry says, yes, yes, and Mo, yes. Hey, hey, and Mo, hey. <laughs> Anyone else? Um, Amanda says she'd love a simple story. All right, that's two. Oh, Sonequa just brought up one of those great lines. Yes, my grandmother is old for me. I legit got chills as I read that line and had to brace myself so I could push through. I've got a third on, uh, <laughs> okay, we've got quorum on the simple story. So I'll tell y'all what, I'm going to put a hold screen on. Um, y'all hold and I will go get the story and I'll be back, all right? Do 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 do. And we're back. Thank you for your patience, y'all. Um, so I went to get the simple book and Tony Cade Bambara fell off the bookshelf. So she's here too. I'm going to go ahead and read the simple story, but I'm going to tell you like this. I am so in love with the works of Tony Cade Bambara. She might become my go-to like I just like on a random day, I might just pop up and read her like, man, those stories feel so good. But let's go on and get the simple going for now. Um, and I love that y'all love simple with me like this, this. This really does my heart good. And tonight's simple story, because we're just moving in order through simple. Tonight's simple story is. Hold on. What was the last one we did? I remember we learned that he was a renegade. Okay, so tonight's simple story is simple on Indian blood. Anybody can look at me and tell I am part Indian, said Simple. I see you almost every day, I said, and I did not know it until now. I have Indian blood, but I do not show it much, said Simple. My uncle's cousin's great grandma were a Cherokee. I only shows mine when I lose my temper. Then my Indian blood boils. I am quick tempered, just like an Indian. If somebody does something to me, I always fights back. In fact, when I get mad, I am the toughest Negro God's got. It's my Indian blood. When I were a young man, I used to play baseball and steal bases just like Jackie. If the empire would rule me out, I would get mad and hit the empire. I had to stop playing that Indian temple. Nowadays, though, it's mostly women's that rouse me up, especially landladies, waitresses and girlfriends. To tell the truth, I believe in a woman keeping her place. 
women's is beside themselves these days. They all want to rule the roost. You have old fashioned ideas about sex, I said. In fact, your line of thought is based on outmoded economics. What? In the days when women were dependent upon men for a living, you could be the boss. But now women make their own living. Some of them make more money than you do. True, said Simple. During the war, they got into that habit. But boss I am still do to be. So you think. But you can't always put your authority into effect. I can try, said Simple. I can say, do this. And if she does something else, I can raise my voice, if not my hand. You can be sued for raising your voice, I stated, and arrested for raising your hand. And she can be annihilated when I return from being arrested, said Simple. That's my Indian blood. You must believe in a woman being a squaw. She better not look like no squaw, said Simple. I want a woman to look sharp when she go out with me. No moccasins. I wants high heel shoes and nylons, cute legs, and short dresses. But I do not want her to talk back to me. As I said, I am the man. Mines is the word, and she is due to hush. Indians customarily expect their women to be quiet, I said. I do not expect mine to be too quiet, says Simple. I want them to sweet talk me. Sweet baby this and baby that and baby you's right, darling, when they talk to me. In other words, you want them both old fashioned and modern at the same time. I said, the convolutions of your hypotheses are sometimes beyond cognizance. Cog hell, said Simple. I just do not like your old loud back talking chick. That's the Indian in me. My grandpa on, fa on my father's side would like that too, an Indian. He was married five times and he really ruled his roost. There are a mighty lot of Indians up in your family tree, I said. Did your granddad look like one? Only his nose. He was dark brown skin otherwise. In fact, he was black. And the women's, man, they was crazy about grandpa. Every time he walked down the street, they stuck their heads out the windows and kept them turned south, which was where the beer parlor was. So your grandpa was a drinking man, too. That must be whom you take after. I am also named after him, said Simple. Grandpa's name was Jess, too. So I am Jess B. Simple. What does the B stand for? Nothing. I just put it there myself since they didn't give me no initial when I was born. I am really just simple, which the kids changed around into a new nickname when I were in school. In fact, they used to tease me when I was small, calling me Simple Simon. But I was right handed with my fist. And after I beat the Simon out of a few of them, they let me alone. But my friends still call me Simple. In reality, you are Jesse Simple, I said. Colored. Part Indian, insisted Simple, reaching for his beer. Jess is certainly not an Indian name. No, it ain't, said Simple. But we did have a Hiawatha in our family. She died. She? I said. Hiawatha was no she. She was a she in our family. And she had long, coal black hair, just like a Creole. You know, I started to marry a Creole one time when I was a coach boy on the L&N down to New Orleans. Them Louisiana girls are beautiful, man. I mean. Why didn't you marry her, fellow? They are more, they are more dangerous than an Indian, said Simple. Also, I do not want no pretty woman. First thing you know, you fall in love with her. Then you got to kill somebody about her. She'll make you so jealous you'll bust. A pretty woman will get a man in trouble. Me and my Indian blood, quick-tempered as I is? No, I do not crave a pretty woman. Joyce is certainly not bad-looking, I said. 
You hang around her all the time. She is far from a Creole. Besides, she appreciates me, said Simple. Joyce knows I got Indian blood, which makes my temper bad. But we take each other as we is. I respect her and she respect me. That's the way it should be with the whole world, I said. Therefore, you and Joyce are setting a fine example in these days of trials and tribulations. Everybody should take each other as they are. White, black, Indians, Creole. Then there would be no prejudice. Nations would get along. Some folk do not see it like that, said Simple. For instance, my landlady and my wife. Isabel could never get along with me. That is why we are not together today. I'm not talking personally, I said. So why bring in your wife? Getting along starts with persons, don't it? Asked Simple. You must include my wife. That woman got my Indian blood so riled up one day, I thought I would explode. I still say I'm not talking personally. Then stop talking, exploded Simple. Because with me, it is personal. Facts. I cannot even talk about my wife if I don't get personal. That's how it is if you're part Indian. Everything is personal. Heap much personal. And thus endeth the story. <laughs> I hate him so much. Um, <laughs> Simple isn't... <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah what <laughs> yeah Sonequa says she forget he keep a stable he does simple keep a stable yo simple keep him a stable going um what was the line no what was Hold up. There was a line back there that it, it messed me. It, it was another T-shirt line for me. It was a T-shirt line for me for sure. What was it? I am the toughest Negro God's got. The thing that makes this so the thing that made it so dope to me is in the type Negro God are both capitalized. And so it just looked is the toughest Negro God's got was my favorite. That was my favorite. Um, Sonequa said, I'm starting to feel like Langston is Simple's conversationalist, having these talks and writing about them. Yeah, I, I want to study a little bit more about the origins of the Simple stories. Um, they absolutely, they absolutely, uh, they, they thrill me. I, I love these stories so much. Um, I live for, <laughs> you say voice when you just Simple. Um, <laughs> the way you hit that first, what when homeboy hit him with all the biggest words in one <laughs> These joints just tickle me. They tickle me so much. They really, really do. Um, Y'all, we still got a little bit more time. I did not, you know, I typically, when I skim the books, I'm able to do a head count for how long it'll take to move through a story. And I think I had, um, I think I overestimated Edwidge Danticat in part because <laughs> I was just looking at the comments and I'm not even going to read this one. I'm just put it on the screen because the ain't shitness is, is thick within this crew. The ain't shitness is thick within this crew. Um, typically I am able to gauge how long a story is going to take. And um, I, I underestimate it now. I'm going to give y'all another shot because we, we, you know, I have a specific time that I end the show. I try to end the show by 1115. That means that we've got 25 minutes. That's enough time going real quick. Um, I believe that's enough time to make it through this particular Tony Cade Bambara story. Now, I could do a couple more simple stories or I could read a Tony Cade story. Or we could all just go home early. It's, uh, it's again, uh, as soon as we hit quorum on one of those choices, I'm going to flow with y'all because we're in this love together. 
<laughs> so what say you? What say you, fam? We can do another simple story. We can do a Tony K. Bambara story, or we can end early. And those of you who are on the after story, we can squat up, have a couple of comments, and move on from there. You want to get inclined to this writing because I freaking love her. Tony Cade going once, Tony Cade going twice, Tony Cade, and that's how it happened. We're going to dive right into this story. Never read it before. We're going to make the woo, we're going to make the most of the time. Thank you so much to our moderators for sharing our contact information. And um, for those of you all who are cool within the night, that's okay. You can, you can sign off. It'll be here for you in the morning. Um, but we are going to read Mississippi Ham Rider from Gorilla My Love. I'll be here tomorrow for my early morning coffee fix. If you're going to meet me, sister, bring your own dime. He swiveled away from the counter and stomped out past the jukebox, huddling his greatcoat around him. I flipped my notebook open and wrote, Mississippi ham rider can best be described as a salty stud. We had talked for nearly an hour, or rather I had talked. He had merely rolled his eyes and stared into his cup as he swirled the watery coffee, revealing the grounds. And I still had nothing to write up, really, except that there was no humor about the man. And at 70... He was not particularly interested in coming to New York to cut records for the blues series. The waitress had wiped the counter menacingly and was leaning up against the pie display with her hands on her hips. I was trying to figure out whether I should follow Ryder, put Neil on his trail, or try to scrounge out a story from the townsfolk. The waitress was tapping her foot, and the cook, a surly-looking bastard in a white cap, was peeping over the edge of the kitchen counter his head kind of cocked to the side so that the sweat beaded around his nostril. I was trying to get myself together, untangle my legs from the stool and get out of there. It was obvious that these particular sinister folks were not going to fill my dossier with anything printable. I moved. But before I even reached the door, I was in the third person abstentular. So what's this high yalla northern bitch doing hitting on evil old ham? There was only one rider in the 10-page directory, an Isabel rider, the address typed in the margin. I folded myself into Neil's Volkswagen and tried to find it. The town itself was something out of Alice or Poe. The colored section was altogether unbelievable. Outhouses, corner hard heads, a predominance of junkyards with people in them, poverty with all the usual trimmings. And Isabel Ryder ran one of those time memorial stores, love potions and dream books and star charts and bleaching creams and depilatory powders and mason jars full of ginger roots and cane shoots. A girl of about 16 was sitting on a milk box, reading a comic book and eating a piece of sweet potato pie. Mrs. Isabel Ryder around? I asked. No. She went right on reading and eating. I'm Inez Williams, I said. The people I work for are trying to persuade Mr. Ham Rider to record some songs. They want him to come to New York and bring his guitar. He's a great blues singer, I said. She looked me over and closed the book. You want some pie? No, thanks. Just Mrs. Ryder. She around? No, just me. I'm Melanie. My mother says Ham ain't going nowhere, nor me either. Lady before asked me to sit in somewhere. My mother says I ain't going nowhere. Ham neither. I leaned on the counter and unbuttoned my sweater. A badly drawn zodiac chart was right in front of me. I traced the orbits, looking for the Aries, the Ram, to give me the high sign. He looked like a very sick dog in the last stages of sickle cell anemia. I tried to figure out the best way to run it down to this girl right quick that they didn't have to live in this town and hang around in this store and eat sweet potato pie for lunch and act like throwbacks before I totally distracted myself with the Zodiac or consideration of abnormal hemoglobins and such like. Look, I said, 
Back in the 20s, a lot of record companies put out a series called Race Records, and a lot of blues singers and country singers and some flashy show business types made a lot of records. Some made a lot of money, but when the Depression came, the companies fell apart and these singers went on home. Some stuck around in my floors and ran elevators. Now this jive mother who is my boss thinks he can make some bread by recording some of the old timers, and they can make some bread too. So what I want is to get your granddaddy to come with us and sing a while. See? You best speak to Ham himself, she said. I did, but he thought I was just trying to get into his business. All I do is write up a thing about the singers, about their life, and the company sticks them on the album cover. She licked the last of the pie from her fingers and stood up. What you want to know? I whipped out my notebook. What does he like? Where's he from? Where's he come from? Who are his friends? Stuff like that. We all three this left. His landlady, Mama Teddy, looks out for him when he gets to drinking and can't help himself. And I get out of his way when he gets raffish, she shrugged. Any chance of us all getting together? My partner, Mr. Neil McLaughlin, is the one who handles the business and all. I'd like you all to meet him. This some fay cat? Uh, yeah. Uh-huh. She ripped off the edge of the calendar and wrote an address. This here where he's at. This here's where we eat, Mama Teddy's. You be here at six. Neil was going into one of his famous crouches by the time I got to the park. He had spent the day trying to find quarters for us both, which was a lost cause. There was not even a diner where we could trade notes about the inc without incident. So I fell in beside him on the bench, jostling the bottle in his pocket. I'm beat and burnt out. I mean it, he wailed, rolling his eyes up to the heavens. This is the most unfriendly town. I escaped from an unbelievable little rooming house with the road just down the road, just as incredible. I escaped from an unbelievable little rooming house down the road, just as an incredible act of hospitality was about to be committed. Yeah, well, look, pull yourself together and let's deal with that rider character first. He's quite a sketch. Jack boots, the original War One bespoke overcoat, razor scar, gravel voice and personality to match. You ready? He'll be damned if he's going up north. Says he was badly mistreated up there. Froze his behind off one winter in Chicago. And in New York, the Negro artist had to use drafty freight elevators to get to the recording studio. Not like the swell conditions here. He wasn't an artist here. I think the best thing to do is just tape him here and let him sign whatever release one signs. <sighs> but old man Lyons, dear heart, wants him in the flesh to allow the poor folksy starved sophisticates to, uh, through a process of osmosis, which in no way should suggest miscegenation, to absorb their native... All right, all right, calm down. The thing is, his last offer was to sing obscene songs for party records. He damn near committed mayhem. In short, the man don't want to leave, buddy. But wasn't he at least knocked out by your superior charms, not to mention your long, lean gams? Those are my superior and singular charms. He was totally unimpressed. But the man's 70-something, keep in mind. Neil slouched over into his hands. This is hard work. I mean it. And I feel a mean and nasty spell coming on. I never had so much trouble and complication in my life before. I've got consumption of the heart and kneel my nerves. They were always so pretty easy to find. Mobile, all burn, just sitting there in a beat up room in a beat up town in a beat up mood, just sitting there waiting for an angel of mercy. Me doing nothing but a moaning and a humming and a strumming. All right, all right, cut it out. We're in trouble. The man don't want to budge, and all you can do is indulge in these theatrical and most unnerving, irritating fits of dear heart recall, he demanded, shoving his spread hand in my face. There was an old man, supper, a real nice old supper man, kind of quiet-like and easygoing, just dipping his snuff and boiling his supper. And then old Jug Henderson, the accident-prone saint of white lightning, fiddling away and sipping that bad stuff out of a mayonnaise jar and kneel my nerves. And old blind grassy Wilson from Lynchburg, 
only one leg left by the time I arrived, but swinging still and real nice and talking into the machine to tell how his best gal slapped a razor across his chops. Enough. You're running amok. I got up and stretched my legs. We've got to find a place called Mama Teddy's. And please, Neil, let me do the talking. I'm tired of eating sandwiches out of paper bags. Just be quiet till after we eat. And no wisecracks. We might get killed. Good Lord, he jumped up. I'm not insured. One false move and the man's liable to cut me, beat me up, starve me to death, and then poison me. He grabbed himself by the throat and rolled around atop the mailbox. A truck passed. I stepped aside and acted like I wasn't with the lunatic. Amazing how your race has deteriorated under segregation. Oh. <laughs> Amazing how your race has deteriorated under segregation, Neil. If only you'd an example to follow, you might have been a halfway decent dancer. He smoothed back his hair and walked quite businesslike to the car. Get in, woman. Mama's Teddy's, Mama Teddy's was a storefront thing. Fried chicken legs and barbecued ribs were painted on the window pane and scrawled across the top in glasses of fuzzy little curly cues were various price-fixed meals. In the doorway, there were three large jugs with soapy brown something or other in them, rag wick stuffed into the necks and hanging over the sides to the floor. But you could see the place was clean, sort of. I was starving. Neil was dragging along the tape recorder, mumbling statistics about hernia and prostate damage. You see that pickup truck over there? He whispered. It's full of angry blacks with ugly sticks who are going to whip my head because they think you're my woman. Never mind. Let's go find Mr. Ethnic Authentic. Neil tripped over the jugs and a whiff of chitlins damn near knocked me over. A greasy smell from the kitchen had jammed up my breathing before I even got into the place. Somebody's dying, whispered Neil. Soul food, I gasped, eyes watering. What? You wouldn't understand, my boy. The large, jovial woman who shuffled out of the kitchen with what only looked like great speed was obviously Mama Teddy. Hello, honey, she said, squashing me into her bosom. Little Melanie told me all about you, and you surely welcome. You too, she said, swallowing up Neil's hand in her fist. She hustled us over to a table with white cloth and flowers. Mr. Ride will be in directly, lessen he's in his cups. And Miss Isabel's expected soon. Just rest yourself. We're going to have a fine southern dinner. You folks from here? She asked me. Mother's from Atlanta. and My father was born in Beaufort, South Carolina. Mm-hmm, she nodded, agreeing that those were certainly geographically fine folks. My people hail from Gaul. <laughs> Sorry. My people hail from Galway Bay, offered Neil. Well, I'm sure they're mighty fine people, too, she winked. Now, is it for true, she whispered, setting the silverware, you taking Mr. Ham to New York to sing? We'd like to, but he doesn't seem very interested. Oh, she laughed, snatching the dishcloth across the table. All that huffing and puffing don't signify. You know what he and Melanie been doing all day? writing out the songs, the words. She's very smart, that girl. Make a fine secretary. I bet you could use a fine secretary with all that writing you do. There must be a lot of jobs. Neil saw it coming. He slouched in his seat and pushed his glasses up. He sat all the while rubbing his eyes. I fingered the soup spoon, vaguely attentive to Mama Teddy's monologue. It was perfectly clear what kind of game she was running. And why not? Along with the numerous tapes and chats and song fests, Neil had collected them from the Delta and the Carolines, a volume of tales that didn't go into the album catalogs, things he was saving for some sensational book he'd never write. The payoffs, bribes, bargains, and deals, interviews in jail cell cells, drug wards, wino bins, things apart from the usual folksy atrocity story. The romance had long since gone out of the job. Neil's first trauma occurred last spring when he finally smoked Bubba Mabley out of a corner. The 60-year-old card shark had insisted on taking his little woman along to New York. The slow-eyed youngster of 15 turned out to be his illegitimate daughter by his niece. It knocked Neil out, though he told it now with a certain rehearsed nonchalance. Mr. Ryder wouldn't think of traveling without his family, the big woman was saying. They're a very devoted family. Neil had worked his eyes into a feverish red, but I was perfectly content. 
One good exploitive act deserved another. And what was the solitary old blues singer going to do after he had run the coffee house circuit and scared the living shit out of the college kids? It was grotesque no matter how you cut it. I wished I was in films instead. Old Ham Ryder, besieged by well-dressed coffee drinkers wanting his opinion on Miles Davis and Malcolm X, was worth a few feet of film. And the quaint introduction some bearded fool in a tight across the groin pants would give would justify even more footage. No amount of drunken thinking could convince me that Mr. Lyons could groom this character for popular hoot nannies. On the other hand, if the militant civil liberties unions got a hold of him, Mr. Charlie was a dead man. Here's Miss Isabel, the woman announced. She looked real enough to upset Lyon's plans. She shook hands and sat down, crossed her legs, and lit up a cigarette. She was good-looking, in a way. Plucked eyebrows, clinging wool dress, scary makeup. You knew she'd been jitterbugging since kindergarten, but she looked good anyhow. So you want the old man to sing, she said, sniffing in curls of smoke. Sits in the window sometimes to sing, but that don't cut no greens, don't make no coins. She swerved around in her chair and kicked Neil's foot. The man needs money, mister. He's been needing it for a long time. Now what you gonna do for him? We're gonna give him a chance to sing, Neil said, catapulting a cigarette butt across the room with the tablespoon. She looked dissatisfied. He needs, she said simply sending up a smoke screen, the image of a great old artist fallen on bad times, holding up a stuffy room, holding up in a stuffy rooming house, drinking bad homebrew out of a jelly jar and howling blues out of the window, appealed to my grade B movie ruined mind. Now, when he gets here, Mrs. Isabel instructed me with her cigarette, you get him to do evil landlord. That's his best. Will he bring his guitar? Neil asked. He most ways do. To the dinner table? Neil persisted. To the dinner table, she said, one eyebrow already on its way to a threatening arch. And I need a cigarette. Mississippi Ham Ryder brought his guitar and his granddaughter. He had on a white shirt and left the great coat at home. He mumbled his greetings and straddled a chair, dislocating my leg in the process. You got a long pair of legs, sister. I had no clever retort, so we all just sat there while Mama Teddy heaved big bowls of things onto the table. There were collard greens and black-eyed peas and ham hocks and a long pan of cornbread, and there were a whole lot of things I'd never seen, even in my household. Bet you ain't ate like this in a long time, Ryder said. Most people don't know how to cook no how, especially you northerners. Jesus Christ, said Neil, leaning over to look into the bowls on the far side of the table. What's that that smells? That's the South, boy, said Ryder. Melanie smiled, and I suppose the old man had made a joke. Neil leaned back and got quiet. I don't sing no cotton songs, sister, he said, picking up a knife, and I ain't never worked in the fields or shucked corn, and I don't sing no nappy-head church songs, neither. No sad numbers about losing my woman and losing my mind. And I ain't never lost no woman, and that's the truth. He sliced the cornbread with a ceremonial air. Good, I said for no particular reason. He looked up, and for one rash moment I thought he was going to smile. I lost my head. But he really looked like he was going to work that bony old ashen skull in that direction. Well, what else is there? Neil finally asked. I mean, just what kind of songs do you sing? My kind. Melanie smiled again, and Miss Isabel laughed on her cigarette. <laughs> but I was damned if I could get a hold of this new kind of humor. After we had eaten, Mama Teddy put coffee on the table and then tended to her customers. I stretched my legs into the aisles and relaxed, watching the old man work up his pipe full. He was impressive the way a good demolition site can be, the way horror movies from the 30s are now. I was tempted to ask him how many people he had killed in his lifetime, thinking I had at least gotten hold of his vein of humor. But I sat and waited for him to sing. I was sure that on the first job he'd turn the place out and maybe do somebody in just for the fun that was in it. And then a really weird thing came over me. I wanted to ask him a lot of dumb things about the South, about what he thought of the sit-ins and all. But he had already taken on a legendary air, 
and was simply not of these times. I cursed Mr. Lyon's fairy tale mentality and quietly indulged in fabricating figures from whole cloth. First, I'm going to sing you my birthday song, he said, pushing the coffee cups to the side. And then I'm going to do this number about a little lady with long legs. Then what? I smiled, putting my cup down. Then I'm going to get drunk directly and pack my things. My bad suspenders and my green hat, he said. One jar of Noxzema and my stocking cap. Melanie laughed straight out and Neil began gagging on Miss Isabel's cigarette smoke. And I got to get a brand new jug of Gallo, he sighed. I don't never do no heavy traveling without my loving spoonful. Then you're coming with us, I asked. We all go on to New York and tear it up, he said. Damn, coughed Neil. Ryder grabbed his guitar by the neck and swung it over the dishes. He gave Neil a terrible look that only aggravated the coughing. But first, I think Mr. Somebody ought to go catch himself some air. I can take it, Neil growled hooking up the tape recorder. He climbed over customers to get to the outlet. It's on, man, he said. Go ahead and sing your song. He looked up at Neil, and then he did smile. I would never want him to smile at me. I can take it, said Neil again, pushing up his glasses. See that you do, boy. See that you do. He plucked at the strings, grinning from ear to ear. And thus endeth the story. Now we are right about at time. That's how that worked out. Those of you all who stuck around with me just heard Mississippi Ham Rider by Tony Cade Bambara from her book, Gorilla My Love. This was kind of a surprise read, so we don't have the information for that book up in the comments, but we will go ahead and add that in. Tonight's main read, however, was from Edwidge Dandicat's Crick Crack. And I know that the information has been posted in the thread for you to check that book out. If these stories moved you, touched you, inspired you, made you want to hear some more, please, ma'am, please, sir, go to your local black bookstore and pick up a copy. If you can't go to your local black bookstore, we have a couple of links that we like to share. We always like to try to support black first, local after that. And then worst case scenario, we always want to at least make sure that there's an outlet. You can find these books on amazon.com, but let's give some of our bookstores a chance first because Jeff got enough paper, don't he? I feel like he does. I'm going to look and see if there's any comments. Um, <laughs> let's see. What do we have? Got a little bit of info about the simple stories. The simple stories were written in Langston Hughes's weekly Chicago Defender column. That I did know, but I didn't know where they came from. She said, uh, Joker tells us that they were inspired by stories his grandmother told him as a child. That tracks. That tracks. I would kill to get one of those old, old copies of The Defender with one of his stories in it. I would frame the shit out of that and hang that in my library. That would be dope. Anyway, let's see. Hey, welcome, Keo. Good to see you. So and so my nerves. I'm I missed which one that was. I'm guessing that that has something to do with the um, that has something to do with one of this with one of the simple stories. Let's see. Thank you so much, Kamisha. As always, I love to read it. And uh, Judy Lee and Sonequa. Let's see. Terry says, I enjoyed that beautifully atmospheric for me. I could see, feel, and smell the soul food. I felt like, I want to know what the greens smell like. I felt like Mama Teddy's joint had a nice breeze that managed to roll through there somehow. Yeah, yeah, I kind of felt that too. That's crazy because it wasn't said there, but I kind of felt that. Last comment of the night. Here we are with the information on where you can find Gorilla My Love. Thank you all for coming out. This has been an extended remix of Storytime with Julian. We went a little bit off book, so to speak, but I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for coming out. This will be available here on Facebook for about a week, and then that's coming down. And please make sure that you subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're going to be uploading some of the back episodes there, and that's where you'll find the archived episodes after we've gone live. All right. Thanks again. Love y'all all much. Peace.
this this it takes me a little bit to get to the end of the show but here we go and peace